Welcome back, scholars. I hope you're well. Um, again, we're going to continue. This is part two uh, to chapter uh, chapter 10, uh, Human Development Across the Lifespan. Uh, so we began with um, prenatal development, and uh, we moved from prenatal development through uh, you know, young adult, young young adolescents, uh, through motor, social development, language development. Um, we talked about uh, the attachment style of, and among caregivers and their infants. Uh, and then we also talked about how we develop our language through uh, fast mapping and some of these other terms that we've learned, overextension, underextensions, telegraphic speech. And if you can remember, many of these um, happen kind of gradually um, as, we, as we begin to interact with our environment and individuals in our environment. Um, so telegraphic speech, you know, uh, instead of using like, prepositions and uh, fillers into your sentence, it's really basic language, right? So it's give ball, uh, eat cookie, right? So it's not any, uh, it's, it's getting right and directly to the point. Um, and then you have what we call over-regularizations where uh, you don't know the uh, grammatical errors. And so you, you put past tense on everything. So I hit it the ball, that hurt it, right? And so those are over-regularizations of uh, the grammatical rules that we've learned and we continue to learn uh, over the course of our life. Um, but again, and the last piece that we talked about was, you know, the development and personality, cognitive development, and then moral reasoning. And here are some of the theories that we've learned about um, Sigmund Freud and Eric Erickson uh, and the personality development. And, uh, and then we talked about the sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational stages. So it's important that you know uh, specifically what happens during those stages and be able to identify them. Um, in particular scenarios, that when we have when we have an exam, you'll see there are questions that are going to ask you about different scenarios and how, what that represents and what stage that represents. Uh, and then finally, we talked about you know that uh, the theory of moral reasoning and uh, the pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional levels. And each of those levels has two independent stages. And in those stages, um, you're making a gradual uh, leap from um, the initial is you know, the authority and external authority is is, is, is key um, and right is right and wrong is wrong based on what you're rewarded uh, for. Uh, it's rewarded, you know, that's, you know, right. And what you're punished for, that's wrong. Uh, and then you move into uh, the conventional phase where uh, the the laws and the rules, uh, they are they are strict, strictly followed. They're very rigid uh, following of rules. And so there's a society that we have to follow and everything that the society says. Uh, must be followed. We must obey them to to a T, and that's kind of where uh, you where you are in the middle of the road there, um, where you're kind of uh, if you're you know middle school, you know people are like, oh, you did something wrong because of the rules that are associated with uh, the schoolyard, right? Uh, and rules are supposed to be followed rigidly. And then the post conventional level, uh, that's where individuals find this um, identity with their their personal ethics. Do the laws, do the rules uh, align with my personal ethics? And do I, uh, do I follow them or do I not follow them based on um, how they align with those things, right? Um, so, you know, a lot of the things that we've experienced in our life and a lot of things that we've seen um, with police brutality and, um, and the injustices with health care and, uh, you know, disparities in health care, education and uh, income, you know, we protest because we don't feel like we're getting a fair shot at uh, achieving and doing the things that we know we can do. Um, and we're not getting everything that we think we deserve. And so we protest uh, and we feel like we're being treated unfairly. We protest the laws and and uh, that's why you see people picketing and, and going out and standing out in front of the state house because of those things that we feel like uh, we have and should have a right to. Um, and again, that. Many people don't reach this point. Um, and sometimes it's very rare or in, in later later adulthood when people reach this post-conditional stage, uh, but some do. And uh, the activists that we see out um, really uh, fighting for some of the, the, the injustices that we see in our, in our country and in our world, those are the individuals who um, have this ethical um, obligation to help those who are disenfranchised and those who are, are being left behind and without a voice. Uh, so again, um, getting to that point means that you are, you're going to make a big difference in, in your community. Okay. 
Uh, now we move on to the transition into adolescence. So we've talked about uh, infancy, kind of when we're moving into toddler and then kind of early, early childhood. Now we're moving into the adolescence period. And with the adolescence period comes a lot of physiological changes and also uh, psychological changes. And we'll talk about the physiological first as we make that transition. Um, my voice is deep and has been deep for a long time because of puberty. We all hit puberty at certain ages and points in time. Uh, as men, we hit it maybe a little later than females do, maybe around 10 to 12 years old. But again, as you begin to hit puberty, your voice begins to deepen, facial hair begins to grow, uh, acne. You see a lot, of, a lot of teens have problems with acne. I had problems with acne for a long time. Um, so you see a lot of those changes happening, not just um, on the outside, but on the inside. Things just continue to develop and grow on the inside of our bodies as well, the organs. Uh, reproductive organs are beginning to grow, uh, hormones are beginning to rage in our body, and so you you see a, a very different person. Um, those who are who are beginning to hit puberty, and uh, it's a really interesting time for young people uh, when this begins to happen. Okay, so you know the physiological changes that occur. We talked about um, you know your your voice begins to deepen. You know the secondary sex characteristics. So we know uh, what our sex is, male and female, and before this time, you know, men and men and women or male and females, they look pretty similar, right? Um, it's only until you begin to uh, hit puberty when you start to see these physical features begin to distinguish between one sex and the other. And they're not essential features that um, are essential for reproduction, but you begin to see the outside the distinguishing factors uh, between someone being a male and a female. You know, the increase in height and weight um, and, and young men and one women, young women, uh, muscles development, uh, muscles developing in men, you know, they start to have a lot more cuts and the abs begin to show hair growth, um, underarm, pubic hair, um, you know, uh, hair on face for, for young men, voice changes that happen in, in men, um, the testes and the ovaries and the other reproductive organs begin to grow uh, in men. Um, you can then now ejaculate your testes are then producing sperm now. Um, and for young women, uh, menstruation happens, um, begins to happen. And so this is the stage where, you know, our sexual functions reach maturity. And again, this, this marks the beginning of adolescence. And, you know, it's important that we are aware of these changes because again, children are gonna be experiencing at different levels at different times, uh, you know, on average children, from around the age of, uh, you know, nine to 10, hit puberty a little earlier. Uh, and uh, then the first occurrence of puberty around 13 to 14 for American boys. And, you know, we reach sexual maturation at uh, different ages as well. And so we have to be mindful of that as we, uh, we look at the individual differences between men and women and their maturity levels and um, their physiological maturity levels. Uh, again, we're, as men, we're a little bit behind uh, development, developing sexually. So we have to be mindful of that as we, uh, as we treat young people when making, when they're making the decision that we'll talk about, uh, some of the <clears throat> other cognitive things that happen in the brain, um, where we're making decisions based on, um, the, the pleasure of things and not thinking about the long-term effects of something that might happen. Okay. But again, puberty, typically, uh, you know, monarchy for women, um, is the first occurrence of administration in American girls, and that happens around the ages of 12 to 13. And then spermarchy, which is, again, the, uh, the creation of sperm, the first occurrence of ejaculation in American boys around 13 and 14. And um, as we'll see, you know, um, puberty is beginning to happen and occur a lot sooner. And we'll see, you know, why that may be the case. A lot of it has to do with the nutrition, uh, technology, technological advances in medicine, um, you know, the social piece, the external environment uh, plays a big role. And so, you know, we just uh, we have to be mindful of that um, as we're um, handling and dealing with young people, um, because, again, they're going through a lot of different things on the inside. Uh, there's a lot of uh, shame sometimes that's associated with uh, the developing of our bodies. You know, we, we don't you know, women or young women are developing breasts at younger ages. So they may be a little more self-conscious. Uh, and develop some kind of anxiety with uh, the changing of their body. I know with men, uh, the, when their voice begins to crack, you know, that's an awkward time 
uh, for men. Um, and, uh, and so when different changes begin to happen, it can, uh, it can be really overwhelming for some young people. Uh, so we have to be, you know, operating race uh, when we're dealing with young people, because again, the changes uh, sometimes can be um, really, really scary. Uh, and uh, the uncertainty sometimes provides, uh, again, that added anxiety. One thing that we can do to help um, through this stage is, you know, the education piece, um, walking through, you know, what these characteristics may look like, um, what they may go through, having an open conversation about these things, I think is really, really uh, essential uh, and necessary because it then helps um, our young people to be a little more comfortable and a little more confident in their body and who they are, who they're becoming, um, and they'll make better decisions and uh, behave a lot better um, and, and, and associate themselves a lot better with others uh, if they know kind of what's happening in their body uh, and are more well-versed in that. Okay. Um, generational changes have occurred in the timing of puberty over the last 150 years. And again, we're seeing puberty hit a lot sooner in young people. Um, the development in those secondary secondary characteristics are happening a lot sooner. I know when I was younger, I had a mustache at about 11, right? 10 or 11, and, uh, and my voice began to crack a lot sooner. Uh, my muscle, my muscular development was happening a lot sooner. Um, but again, it is happening in both men and women, right, at younger ages, and uh, it, com it completes more rapidly than earlier, earlier generations, okay? Uh, the timing of puberty does vary um, from one adolescent to the next, but we do see, on average, uh, an earlier occurrence of uh, monarchy and sperm archy um, in, in young men or young women and men. Uh, the reasons for this trend could be, uh, again, nutri nutritional improvements, um, the improvements in medical care, and other environmental pollutants that are influencing uh, hormonal changes in our bodies, those endocrine disruptors with, you know, poor, maybe maybe it's, you know, pollution or uh, water pollutants, all of those different things. The, the foods that we're eating um, have different chemicals in them that are speeding up the process and releasing certain hormones in our bodies that are rushing the process and speeding up the process of puberty. Uh, so, um, again, we have to be extremely and extremely diligent and uh, in protecting ourselves from these pollutants, uh, you know, the foods and the, uh, the deodorants and the shampoos that we use also affect our uh, hormones in our body, which then can influence our, our timing with our puberty and our young people. Okay. So the physiological changes are one thing, and then the neurodevelopment becomes another big hot topic. Uh, you know, young people are extremely immature. Their attention spans are really, really short. And that is because of their development in their brains. Uh, with an immature prefrontal cortex, this oftentimes explains why uh, more adolescents are taking bigger risky behaviors, right? Especially uh, sexual risky behaviors, right? And so that the prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain that uh, develops. And when you see uh, a child making, uh, you know, making rash decisions or experiencing uh, heightened emotional uh, states and swings of emotion, you know, um, you know, during this time, you know, young people are beginning to form relationships with the opposite sex. And so they're making these relationships and creating these relationships. And when something goes wrong in those relationships, emotionally, they can't they can't see that even if something happens negatively in their relationship, it's not the end of the world. But young people, again, without that uh, rational thinking, without the, the, the decision making uh, being the, the part of the decision making process happens in the prefrontal cortex. And when that is not happening uh, at an optimal level, then they make really, really rash decisions and they feel like things that do happen are the end of the world. Um, again, like the prefrontal cortex and the maturation of the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed and accomplished um, until the age of about 25, 26 years old. Um, so we're still making um, really unwise and dumb decisions uh, even into our uh, early 20s, right? And so uh, that is one reason why we we have to have a, a group, group of people around us um, to help us make better decisions. You need a, you need a great support system. Um, those individuals are going to help you uh, make better decisions because in your own brain, um, you're going to make some dumb decisions based on um, you're not your brain not being fully developed. Okay, um, the first part of the brain, the hind brain, um, we talk about the limbic system. Those are the parts that are 
uh, most in control of our emotions and emotional development, and then also kind of the uh, the physiological functioning in our bodies, right? And so we see that in this blue area, this is that thinking and the learning and the language and the, uh, the inhi inhibitions that we have, those are being formed on the outside of you. So without this, um, thankfully, developer, we're going to have some issues uh, with um, making the best decision um, and the optimal decision. Um, early maturity, the reward system, again, down here in the uh, the brain stem, you know, and then in the limbic system, it overpowers our late maturing prefrontal cortex, right? So uh, we like rewards here, you know, in the, in the you know, the brain stem, the, the limbic system, right? We want a high reward and we don't think about the consequences, right? So we're going to make some really bad decisions um, sexually or with, you know, peer pressure, those things are going to going to overtake, um, you know, what we what we think is uh, the best decision in the long run, right? And so we're really, really susceptible to peer pressure. Uh, and it, again, can also contribute to uh, adolescent risk taking, right? So, you know, even now for many of you uh, in your early 20s, you're still going to be experiencing some issues with making the best decision. Um, but again, having some, uh, some trusted individuals who can help you work through the decision itself uh, can help you make uh, better decisions instead of just jumping off the handle and, and just going with with how you feel right off. Sometimes it's able, you have to take a step back, um, take a couple minutes to, to kind of process and then make the decision because we're our hot emotions. We make decisions in those hot emotions periods. We're not going to make the best decision at all. One of the other things that we do in adolescence is uh, we're searching for our identity. We talked about that in um, and, uh, you know, the Eric Erickson's theory of personality development, there is a, uh, a development of our identity. Are we able to uh, determine who we're going to be um, and where we're going to go? Right. So James Marsha you know, proposed four different identity statuses. And, uh, you know, the first one is what we call the identity dis diffusion. Um, it's a state of kind of rudderless apathy. We don't have any really commitment to anything. So if people are to ask you what you want to be when you grow up, you're like, I don't know. I have no clue what I want to be when I grow up. Many of you may not know uh, what you want to be right now, but in this time of your life, you know, whether you're in college or not, this is a great opportunity to explore different options in, in you know, your career, uh, in your education, because this gives you an opportunity to see, you know, what you might be committing yourself to, right? If you want to uh, get a trade and, and work as a mechanic or work in, in plumbing or in HVAC, this is a great time to, under, to, to figure out, you know, what, what am I going to be able to commit myself to doing that's going to lead me to a successful career later? If I want to go into education uh, and get an education, what area of education do I want to get? You know, do I want to go into psychology, or criminal justice, or engineering, sports management? I have to figure out, you know, what I want to do, right? So this is not uh, these different identity statuses, they're not wrong, right? You're in a point of crisis where you're trying to figure out what's going on, what my life is going to be, who am I, who am I going to become. Identity foreclosure is kind of a, a premature commitment to your visions, values, and your roles. And this is not always the best. Uh, sometimes this happens when um, our social environment is uh, kind of influencing our decision on what I want to be, right? If my mom and dad are both um, you know, medical doctors or engineers, then I will sometimes develop this premature commitment to this vision of what I see myself as, or maybe my all of my family are educators, and I feel like I'm supposed to be an educator. And it's kind of a premature foreclosure on an identity that you haven't been able to explore. Um, and so sometimes this is the reason why you get to college with an idea of what you want to be. I went, I went into college wanting to, to major in computer science. And I did that because I grew up in Huntsville, you know, you know, the Rocket City, very, very technical um, engineering, computer science. They are really, really high. You get a, then you can also make a lot of money. And so that's what I went into college thinking I wanted to do. Uh, and then that's why, you know, students are changing their majors, uh, you know, five, six, seven, even up to 10 times before they lock in on a major um, because of they, they have this premature commitment to something. Uh, identity moratorium. This is that uh, delay of commitment to experiment with alternative ide ideologies and careers. And so, again, this is a really, really great place because, again, this is where you're exploring 
You don't come in with pretty much any pre preeminations, right? You don't have any, any, you're not locked in on any one thing yet. And so you're just exploring, you know, you're, you're undecided right now on what your major is, what you want to do with your career, uh, what you want to do with your life. And this is a great place to be because now you can kind of experiment, ex explore with different alternatives, different, different options. And then you can hone in on something later on. Identity achievement is that last piece where you arrive at this sense of self and direction after some consideration of alternate alternative possibilities. And this is a really great place because it's coming after the moratorium where you're, you're looking at and trying different things. And if we've ever tried different things and, and operated in different ways to see what works for us, and we, we find that one thing that makes us happy and that we get fulfillment from, this is a perfect place because you have a really true sense of who you are because you've already experimented with some other things, right? I locked in on psychology because I've done economics, I've done business, uh, and I've locked in on helping people. That's one of the, the, big, the biggest things that I love to do. I love to serve people. And psychology, community psychology was that, that it gave me a sense of identity and a sense of self. I was able to develop, you know, who I was going to be. And I get fulfilled by teaching. Right. So not just teaching, but with research and working in the community, all of those things are those possibilities that I was able to explore. And that's why I am and have become a professor and then also work in the community to help uh, those who are disenfranchised uh, and uh, disadvantaged. Okay. All right. So here is just a, a visual representation for those who are visual learners, um, you know, for a closure. You know, you're, you're high in commitment, very low in exploration, you know. I've made a choice and I'm really thinking about it. That happens again in a lot of environments where, uh, again, the social piece right around you is kind of forcing you to make a decision without even uh, even thinking through some of the options that you might have. Um, the exploration is high, the commitment is high. This is identity achievement. I thought about it and now I know what I should do with my life. This is a great place to be, right? In college, you reach this point, maybe around your sophomore, or junior year. Uh, and hopefully you reach it a lot sooner. Um, but again, this is a place where you're like, I know what's going to motivate me to keep going, right? I know my why. And when you know your why and what you're going to want, what you want to do with your life, then all of your goals, all of your behaviors begin to lead you towards that. And the sub goals that you create help lead you towards that, that point where, where you want to be in your life. Low commitment, um, low exploration. This is kind of that identity diffusion. I don't know. I really don't care what, I, what I'm supposed to do with my life right now. Um, many people, you know, teenagers don't really know. They don't really care, right? I just want to play basketball. I want to play football. I don't really care what I do right now. Um, you know, and they might have a dream uh, to, to do things, but they don't, and they're not exploring anything right now. Um, and the last thing is uh, talk about low uh, commitment, high exploration. This is the moratorium period. This is a great place to be. Um, this is, you know, your freshman and sophomore year. You're trying to Think about the classes that you're taking. What's what's really happening? Why right? it's really helping you to um, to really feel fulfillment. You took a class in psychology. You took a class in in, in, in criminal justice, and you're like, man, I really really like this topic. Here. I'm reading the the articles, reading the textbook. I'm engaging in the assignments, and this is really something that I think I could do. And then you hit uh, the in, in identity achievement, and that's a great place to be um, um, in in life. Um, when we talk about emerging adulthood, this is kind of that new place. Um, this is a, a new, um, a new kind of place where we talk about the new development of stage. And this is that place right before your your brain kind of fully develops, your prefrontal cortex fully develops. But this is where people, you know, are making making really you know big life decisions. Um, they're not fully grown, but they're almost there. And this, you know, this is kind of any, anywhere between. Um, you know, 18 and 29, this is kind of that, that age range where you're kind of not com completely adult. You're still kind of depending on your, your parent to help you make decisions, to pay for things. Uh, and then towards the end, now I'm, I'm ready to, to become a full adult after I graduate college or, you know, finish, finish trade school or, you know, kind of work, work in my career. I've kind of moved out of the house. Um, I'm kind of self-sufficient now. And, you know, emerging adulthood, you know, you ask somebody, at various ages, do you feel like you've reached adulthood? And, you know, a yes and a no, this is kind of in that area there, right? For many people, 18 to 25, they'll say yes and no. Um, so that's kind of the emerging adult period. 
And then as you move to 26 to 35, the, the yes and no becomes, begins to decline, right? 36 to 55, um, again, you should see yet less and less people say yes and no, right? So this area, uh, especially this area, this area, this is where we see the burden of COVID um, happen, right? Um, is that kind of making that 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 transition um, from adolescence to full adulthood where I don't have to depend on my parents anymore. Uh, and I just use my parents when I need um, maybe some advice on, on something that I'm doing. Okay. And this is just a, you know, just something for you to think about. You know, most colleges, most college students fall between 18 to 25. You know, so do you feel like you've reached adulthood? Uh, why do you feel this way? Uh, why don't you feel this way? And then there's a, um, a reflective writing where I want you to think about adulthood. You know, what are some some things that occur there? You know, what are some some milestones that you hit, um, some markers that you that you hit where, you know, yeah, now I'm an adult. Is it when you uh, pay your own insurance or pay your car note? Uh, is it when you pay your, your rent? Um, is it when you move out of the house? Um, some people at the age of 18, you know, their parents are no longer really taking care of them. They move out of the house at 18 and they are completely on their own. Um, but. Now that we see that, you know, the prefrontal cortex is not really all that great at making decisions, rational decisions, and not really good at logical, making logical decisions and, and good, sound decisions, um, should we continue to support our young people even until the age of 25? Because we're seeing that more and more people need that support. Um, and, you know, 18 to 25, children are still staying at home. Um, you know, when I graduated college, I moved back home with my mom for a little bit. Uh, until I got a job and was able to get back on my feet because, you know, I was not ready. I don't, I didn't feel like I was ready. You know, some people are, uh, but many young people are not. And so uh, do we continue to support our, our children at, you know, 25 to 30? Um, and I think we do, you know, until they are self-sufficient and move out of the house and, and really start making decisions that are, are sound. I think that's when then we can start to, to kind of re release some of the support and not so completely release the support. But again, allow them to kind of uh, push out and, and make decisions on their own uh, in a gradual way, not just cut it off at 18 and then see them stumble and fall and, and fail. And, and then they have to move back with us because they uh, because we didn't give them uh, a gradual kind of release out into the real world. Okay. So at the expanse of adulthood. So this gets to, you know. Starting a family, getting married, starting a family, um, and then moves into some of the things that we experience as we move through through adulthood. And that personality development piece is really, really important. Eric Erickson's piece, we talked about those last three uh, stages, uh, six, seven, and eight. So we'll talk about that as well. Okay. Um, so personality development. Um, when we talk about personality, um, Eric Erickson, um, you know, Sigmund Ford was, was saying that, um, you know, the personality kind of at the age of five, you kind of fully developed your personality. Um, and Eric, Eric Erickson kind of built on um, what Sigmund Freud uh, was positing and said, no, we kind of evolve and continue to evolve over the course of our lives. And so personality is uh, kind of stable, but it does change. Uh, there is some stability in who we are. If we're always, if we're extroverted as young people, we're likely gonna be continuing to be extroverted uh, as we age and, and you know, and then if we are, you know, more conscientious, you know, we're more detail oriented and, and organized, we're going to be that way for the majority of our life. Um, and so it's kind of stable, but it does change depending on different lived experiences that we have. Um, when we talk about the aging, right? So neuroticism is, you know, being very um, anxious about things that are happening in our environment. And, uh, you know, Maybe I'm really anxious about what happens next in my life, right? I'm really, really anxious about the decisions I have to make later on in life. Um, neuroticism moderately declines as we age, right? As we, um, as we get more comfortable with living, uh, get more comfortable with adulthood, you know, called adulting, right? Once you're a little more comfortable with, with the adulting period of our lives, neuroticism and our, our worries about what's happening and what's going to happen in our life begin to decline. Uh, agreeableness, our openness to experience and conscientiousness tend to increase gradually because we're, become, we're becoming an adult, right? We're increasing our skill set. Um, we want to experience certain things. We don't want to travel. Um, we 
begin to become more agreeable, right? We need a social support. We need friends. We have coworkers. Um, so we have to be a little more agreeable um, in order to, uh, to be successful at work or at school. Um, being more conscientious, right? You have to uh, be on top of your bills, be on top of, you know, some of the things that we have to take care of when we're, when we're parents, right? You got to make sure that your, your kid is up for school. You have to be able to feed them. You have to budget to make sure you have enough money to pay for certain things that you need, right? And then in the late adulthood, right, after around um, 70s and 80s, uh, neuroticism begins to increase again. And this is that that end part of life where you're, you're beginning to think about death and, you know, what's going to happen? Did I do everything that I wanted to do? Do I have any regrets? Um, do I do I feel like... Um, I still have things I want to accomplish. Um, extroversion, agreeableness, and conscientiousness begin to decline, right? So we're getting into that period of late life, late adulthood, where you know we're we're really kind of trying to figure out again what's happened, what happened in my life. Am I am I who I wanted and and and, and, and kind of strive to be, right? Did I reach that that ultimate goal that I was talking about when I was in my my early twenties and thirties? Um, and there are even variations to the extent uh, and to which people experience personality change. Some people experience it uh, in, a, in a more drastic way. And again, um, our lived experiences play a big role. You know, the, the situational and the circumstances that we have in our life play a role in, in how our uh, personality either is more stable or changes over the course of time. Um, you know, the biggest changes um, tend to occur between the ages of 20 and 40. Uh, so, you know, at one point, we were knuckleheads and we weren't all that conscientious. We weren't really all that organized. Didn't really care about saving money. And then as we began to mature into, uh, you know, middle adulthood, we were becoming a lot more responsible, conscientious, more agreeable, um, and uh, we're more open to different experiences, right? We want to travel and experience different things in our late adulthood um, before we, we had to settle down and, and are alone, no longer able to travel um, because of old age. Um, and then the typical development, uh, you know, tends to represent a positive change that move people toward greater social maturity, right? So we move from, you know, being really, really immature um, socially. We don't, we, we don't have a lot of friends that are kind of staying around. And then in middle adulthood, we start to develop relationships uh, that last, right? And that social maturity, we, we're a lot more mature cognitively because our brains are fully developed. We're making better decisions. And, uh, and so we make better social decisions as well as we uh, interact with people around us. Okay. Um, Eric Erickson, again, divided adulthood into these three stages. Uh, we talked about the first five, um, and we we're talking about personality development in young people up through adolescence, uh, but intimacy versus isolation. So this happens right around the, the emerging adulthood, right, early adulthood. Um, the key concern here is whether, you know, I want to develop and share intimacy with other people, or if I just want to be alone. Right. We we see young people making decisions on, you know, do I want to get married versus not get married? Do I want to be in a relationship versus not? Uh, there are people who and many people are going to get married. Many people want to have that sense of belonging with someone um, and want to develop and get married and have a relationship with people, even if they're not, um, you know, getting a formal marriage. They want to live with someone. They want to have a relationship um, versus remain in isolation. And isolation doesn't mean that you're. You're completely alone. You don't have any friends. It just means that you're not wanting to share that that real big intimacy with someone where you're living together and, um, you know, then beginning to have kids and, and do those types of things. Uh, the number two thing is uh, the, the, the last, second to last stage is generativity versus self-absorption. So in middle adulthood, the key challenge here is do I really care and have a genuine concern for the welfare uh, of others? Do am I serving? Um, am I getting out and helping someone else? Am I mentoring someone? Uh, am I uh, going to uh, give my time to nonprofits and helping people to uh, make better decisions in their in their their lives? Am I helping them to uh, you know make better decisions with uh, school and um, their career choices? Am I going to use my experiences to help someone else? Am I going to reach back to help the next generation, or am I just going to be self-absorbed, make my money, do what I do? you know, earn my income, go travel, uh, not really care about, you know, helping people. I'm just really concerned about my own own well-being. I have friends and I'll help 
every now and then, but I'm not really concerned about uh, the welfare and the future of the generation to come. And then the last piece, um, this is kind of that late adulthood during retirement years and then even into, you know, the 70s and the 80s, integrity versus despair, right? During retirement years, the challenge here is I want a tendency to dwell on the mistakes of the past uh, and on one's imminent death, right? So integrity, I've done everything that I decided to set out to do. I was able to help people. I was able to inspire people and help individuals make uh, uh, and reach their fullest potential. Right. So I have this integrity of I did what I set out to do. I had goals and I reached those goals. I had family. My children are are doing well. Uh, I feel like I've done everything that I can do. And then the despair piece is for those individuals who may not have done and achieved everything that they wanted to do. They have this resentment um, that, set, that, that sets on the inside of them. Like I didn't do everything that I wanted to do. And with imminent death approaching. Right. I feel like I, I have some regrets. I didn't help as many people as I, as I wanted to help, right? There should be some balance there, right? Where, you know, you're able to help people um, in the middle of adulthood and as you're helping people, as you begin to age, by the, by the time you get done, you don't want to leave any stone unturned, right? You don't want to have any regrets. You want to live your life fully, right? And when you live your life fully with integrity, right? You'll see that you're fulfilled and at the end, you'll be at peace, right? When you're kind of live, living in a kind of a self, you're kind of isolated, you're kind of self-absorbed, you're kind of in a despair piece, right? You, you don't get this sense of fulfillment. You don't get this sense of, you know, I've done everything that I could do and I've helped as many people that I can help, right? Um, and then again, on these um, intimacy versus isolation, it's kind of on a continuum, right? So you're not just gonna be complete, completely on the intimacy side, intimacy side and completely on the isolation side, it might be, a, again, on a continuum, might lie somewhere in between um, those two extremes there. And both uh, in all, all three of these, and even in, uh, in the other um, different stages that we talked about in Eric Erickson's uh, eight stage theory. Okay. Uh, so when we talk about transition, right, uh, more young adults are really prolonging uh, getting married, right? Um, you know, many people don't want to get married. And, and many times it's, it's really just based on um, the generations and and what we've been able to see um, earlier generations were getting married a lot sooner. So you see uh, in 1950s, uh, females were getting married at, you know, 20 and a half. Males were getting married at about, you know, 22.8, right, average age. And then now more and more people are waiting uh, to get married and to have children. Um, you know, the median age of uh, first marriage is increasing, right? Myself, I'm getting married um, this year at the age of 35, but I've waited because uh, there are things that I wanted to do um, with my education uh, and my career. And now I feel like I've had some, um, some balance. Um, and now I've achieved some things that I can now take into marriage and then be able to fully support uh, uh, someone else and myself. Uh, more than about 90% of people will eventually get married. But again, like we said, um, you know, many people may not, um, but many, many will. It just might take a little longer for them to get married uh, because of a lot of the things that they want to see happen. Um, adjusting to married life is, is, it's scary, right? It's a, it's a commitment. They say that when you wake up each morning, um, after being married, it's a commitment each day. You have to make a commitment to your spouse that I'm going to love them in spite of who they are, uh, who they're becoming, right? When you make a commitment to, to marry somebody, you have to wake up each day and really make a conscious effort to love them in spite of everything that happens. Because again, Work, marriage, other financial concerns, you know, and then financial problems is one of the biggest uh, reasons why couples get divorced. Uh, you got to have um, a, a big balance and, you know, cohabitating prior to marriage has gradually become the norm. And it's not it's not that it's not um, the right thing to do. Um, it's just it's just something that's happening. And there's no there's research that shows that it might even help with with couples and, uh, you know, kind of decreasing the, the incidences of, of divorce because now you get an understanding of who they are. You've lived with them for a little bit. Um, so now you you don't have to uh, be hit with all this awkwardness uh, when you first move in with someone. It's good to kind of get, get a feel for hey, who, who they are as a person before you marry them. Kind of try it out and see uh, if, you know, them leaving the socks on the floor, or the way they, they wash the dishes or are they clean? Um, all those things happen um, and you get to see. Um, if 
if they are clean or not, or if, you know, what their quirks are. Um, and that's important to see. Um, one other thing that happens is kind of the negotiating of the marital roles. And and many times, you know, maybe the man is making more than the woman or the man, the, 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 the female is making more uh, in the breadwinner of the home. Right. But how do we negotiate those roles? And and sometimes that becomes a really major source of conflict uh, in many marriages, really trying to see who who does what, you know, is the, the male going to be taking out the trash and cutting the grass is the. the female going to be washing the dishes or doing everything on the inside, or do you share the responsibilities? And I am a, kind of, I'm a big proponent of sharing responsibilities. Yeah, I, I'll go out and cut the grass because I love cutting grass and I'll do some of the more strenuous things because I have the strength and the ability to do it. But I'll also, you know, wash, wash the baseboards and, you know, wash dishes and do laundry. Um, and do I do my own laundry or I, do I allow my, my wife to do the laundry, right? So we have to make those decisions and, you know, communication is a big key here uh, and, and setting out, you know, your uh, setting out expectations is really, really important um, so that you don't have that conflict. And there's going to be conflict. Conflict is a way is is natural to any uh, any relationship and it's, and it's healthy. Um, but the ways that we uh, can, you know, handle conflict, do we do it in a really help, healthy uh, and optimal way? That's that's the key. Okay. So that's marriage. And then after you get married, um, you know, many people, you know, decide that they want to have children. And uh, and most married couples continue to have children. Um, and um, that transition to parenthood is a is a really weird one. I was talking to one of my friends and he said that, you know, year seven to year 10 is really, really tough, especially when you have ch children. Um, there is a, uh, a conscious effort that has to be made to find a balance to take uh to make your relationship and, and pay, make your relationship a priority because when children enter the, the, the equation, you know, you're, you're taking a lot of your energy and your attention away from your spouse and really putting it on your children and the decisions that have, have to be made, um, again, are based on children. Um, parents exhibit, you know, a lower marital satisfaction than comparable non-parents. And that satisfaction kind of maintains, uh, it's, it's kind of stable until the children uh, move out of the house. Um, because again, um, until the children get older and then we can, we can, you know, get out of the house. But it's really important that parents make a conscious effort to uh, maintain a relationship, maintain an intimate relationship and don't allow children to uh, to derail uh, the, the intimacy, the, the relationship, the, uh, the communication that you all have. Because when that happens, then marital satisfaction then does decline. Um, the mothers of infants report uh, the steepest decline in marital satisfaction simply because many men uh, feel like women should take complete responsibility for taking care of the infant. Um, but when men take a take a role and take an active role in taking care of the infant, when the, the mom and give the mom a chance to get a get a rest, right? And having family and having support also plays a big role because you have, you can maybe uh, your family can step in and give you a break um, to. Um, to have that time together uh, to to kind of mitigate some of that marital dissatisfaction that children have. Um, and adolescents, gradual realignments occur um, with the parent and child relationship. Um, so, you know, there there are some things that, you know, in relationships that things that happen and change, right? Um, so children are able to make, make more decisions. You give them car keys, uh, you give them curfews, and now, you know, they're no longer as dependent on you. And, you know, they have girlfriends and, um, and other friends that they associate themselves with uh, from school and, and wherever else. And so now you're, you, you may have a little more time to kind of worry and focus on, the, on your relationships with your, your significant other. Uh, but again, there are some, you know, realignments that occur um, from, you know, infancy to, you know, early, early childhood to, you know, the adolescence period. And, you know, when they get to high school, maybe, maybe you have a little more time to yourself. Uh, but there is a lot more tension, right? Because they want autonomy and you want control because they're living under your roof. So there becomes this, um, you know, this tension, this conflict at times, sometimes that, that happens and occurs uh, during this time. Okay. Um, so again, that that is the uh, the piece where, you, you know, you have your, you're getting married, you're, you're uh, having children. And then here are some of the physical changes, uh, physiological changes that occur 
uh, with aging, right? The, the physical changes, obviously, for men uh, and women, you know, hair may thin, you might get grays. I'm getting grays in my beard, uh, finding grays, um, you know, loss of hair in men who, who have male pattern baldness. Uh, the amount of body fat tends to increase because your metabolism um, begins to decrease. Uh, and so it's important that um, you, you work your body, you work the muscles in your body so that you're, you're maintaining muscle mass. Because when you're maintaining muscle mass, it improves a lot of different things that happen. Nutrition plays a big role during this time um, because, again, it helps to, uh, we talk about those hormonal changes, but it helps to create um, optimal hormones being released in your body. Uh, farsightedness and difficulty seeing uh, in low light more is more common, right? So having difficulty seeing far, you maybe need some reading glasses to see things close up. Uh, you're declining your hearing and sensitivity more noticeable about after the age of 50. We talked about, um, you know, sensation and perception, and how uh, there is a, we can speed up our hearing loss uh, by having um, loud music and putting those earbuds in our, in our ears and, and ramping it up or being exposed to really, really high volumes of sound. Uh, and so we want to be really, really cognizant of that as we're aging, um, that we don't speed up that process because we see that the, the declining in hearing is already going to happen naturally uh, at the age of 50 because um, those the cilia uh, and those hair-like cells in, uh, in our cochlea are you know, going to be aging and then you know, they're, uh, they're going to decline um, in the number of cells in our hair cells in our ears. Uh, so we want to be cognizant of that and protect our hearing uh, at earlier stages. Hormonal changes happen. Uh, mental pause happens in women. Uh, chronic diseases increases and hormones help kind of diminish the effects of aging. So, again, we have to eat the right foods, uh, get the proper amount of rest, uh, work out and, and get those things in our body to, to, to release those things optimally. If we need help with supplements, those things can also help to, to again, diminish those effects of aging. Um, the neural changes that happen, um, you know, brain tissue and, and brain's weight decline gradually. Uh, it's just a natural thing that happens. It's, it's really difficult to change or to stop, you know, the brain tissue and the brain weight from, uh, from declining. But there are things that we can do, um, like uh, creating a more stimulating environment, you know, um, have a complex problem solving environment. Um, those who have, you know, worked a little longer and are working in, in industries that, that uh, require that they um, solve problems and have complex thought, those individuals are kind of diminishing or are slowing down the decline in their, their neural, the neural changes that happen in their body uh, or in their brain, excuse me. Um, dementia is that abnormal uh, condition marked by multiple cognitive deficits uh, that include different memory impairment, right? Uh, so the types of dementia, dementia is kind of the umbrella term, but you have Alzheimer's, you have Lewy body, frontotemporal uh, disease. And so all of these um, are um, different types of dementia that happen. And uh, it's important that we look at our, uh, our brain health uh, and our cognition. Uh, we, can, we can fight against some of the dementia and um, against memory loss. That's already going to happen. It's a natural thing that happens. Uh, and we can fight against that with uh, training our brain um, to, to do certain tasks and problem solving. And, and working in, in, in environments that are mentally stimulating because um, that does mitigate uh, and diminish the, um, the factors that happen um, for dementia and other weight, uh, memory loss. Okay, So again, here's some protective factors. We talked about um, regular exercise, um, lower cardiovascular risk factors, uh, frequent participation and stimulating cognitive activities like, you know, puzzles and, uh, and different problem solving. Uh, maintenance of act, active social engagement with friends and family. So don't isolate yourself. Get around people you love. Um, go out, interact, uh, be social. Um, numerous studies that, you know, report that decreases in older adults' memory capabilities. It happens gradually. It's a natural thing that happens. But we can, um, again, mitigate that. There are protective factors. The speed of learning, the speed of problem solving and processing speed, that, that declines. Uh, as we age, and one way to uh, diminish that, I mean, one way to kind of uh, slow the decline of our processing speed is by looking at those stimulating cognitive activities. Uh, there are some things that doctors have done to create, you know, online uh, cognitive activities that you can participate in, right? Problem-solving skills, crosswords, 
you know, all of these different things. Word searches help to kind of mitigate some of these, these factors that might uh, influence the, the decrease in decline in solving problems in this processing speed, right? But there again, there is evidence that does support that notion that the high levels of mental activity in late adulthood can delay um, the typical age-related declines in cognitive functioning. So again, right now you have a really, really sharp brain, really quick, you can hold things in memory um, for longer periods of time. The speed at which you learn, the speed at which you problem solve is really, really high. But over the course of time, that declines unless um, you have high levels of mental activity uh, well into a late adulthood. And so it's really important that you just don't stop um, learning. We're, we're left lifelong learners. So get out and learn something new. Um, get out and explore um, new environments. Uh, so it helps to, to continue to develop the brain and those neural connections in your brain so that you're, you're, you're having a better quality of life. Um, later on. Okay. Um, one other thing that we discuss um, is death and dying. When we talk about late adulthood, um, we're going to, we're all going to reach that point where we, we're, we're reaching the point of death, right? In our own lives uh, and in our friends, families, uh, and um, in loved ones, right? Anxiety about death um, typically declines from around early uh, to late adulthood, right? So right now we we fear death, right? We we fear because we haven't lived uh, enough, right? We don't feel like we've achieved all that we can achieve. So our anxiety, and we talk about fear of death, um, you know, that's a higher anxiety there because of a thing where, where we have a lot of things, a lot more things that we want to accomplish. And then as we um, begin to mature and continue to mature into a late adulthood, that anxiety begins to decline because again we we've lived, we've had our children, um, we've achieved things that we wanted to achieve in our career. Uh, our children are doing extremely well. Maybe now we have grandchildren, right? So we, we're at a point now where I don't have a lot of regret, regret right? Um, I feel like I've lived, lived a full life. And so the anxiety is a lot less. Um, the attitude about death um, varies from culture to culture. Um, and various cultures, especially in Mexican cultures, um, they celebrate death, the Day of the Dead, right? So they have this national feast day where they celebrate death and they, they speak openly about death and they feel like death is a is an important part of life um but in you know western cultures we it's kind of taboo to speak about death um and so we don't really like to speak about it and since we don't speak about it we have a lot more anxiety and fear of it um but again in other cultures they may not have uh, a lot of anxiety about death and uh, because of they speak about it it's, it's a normal thing that they discuss uh, elizabeth kubler ross identified five stages of confronting death and what, how she did this is what she went into a, uh, a hospital and uh, these individuals were terminally ill. They were reaching their the point of death and she was interviewing them. And these are five um, different stages that she said individuals kind of go through as they're confronting death. And again, these were terminally ill patients and she was interviewing them uh, at different various stages of their illness to determine kind of where they were uh, in there, in the stage of them confronting death. Uh, the number one thing, uh, the first one was, the first stage was denial. So they, they're like, man, I, I really don't want to die. Or I don't, I don't, I think, I, I think I'm going to continue to live. Um, so they're in denial. They don't, they don't feel like they, they're actually going to die. Um, and then the second one is anger, right? They, they're, they're angry with uh, the fact that they're going to die and they don't want to, they don't want to die, right? They're angry with it. They have uh, some distress. The third one is bargaining with God for, for more time. If, if you give me, if if I do this for you, God, if you do this for me, God, I'll serve you. Um, you know, I'll do this for you, God. I will, um, I'll, I'll make sure that I'm, I'm a good person and I don't, I don't do this. And I, I, I give to the poor and I help more people if you give me more time. Right. And then the last, the, the second, the last is, you know, depression. Right. Now I, I, I bargain with God. He's not, he, it's not getting any better. I'm terminally ill. I still feel like I'm on that the brink of approaching death and I'm, I'm kind of depressed. I don't feel um, like I can go anymore. And then the last one is acceptance. I've accepted um, that, you know, my time is, is approaching and I'm OK with it. I'm at, I'm at peace with that. Right. I'm at peace with um, me uh, ending uh, and, and moving on into uh, immortality. Okay. Um, and when we talk about those. Um, those five, um, you know, not everyone goes through each of those various stages. Um, research has shown that, you know, 
you may go through some, but you know, those, those five stages, that's just a good start. Um, and she was one of the first persons to identify and, and, and study death and dying and, and how we um, think about it and how we move through stages of uh, the emotional and the cognitive piece of, of how we think about dying. Um, but there are, again, considerable variations that exist among how we uh, deal with um, how, when we're going to die. Uh, and there are some variations in how we deal with bereavement, you know, the death of a friend, or spouse, or, or a relative. And um, studies of bereaved spouses suggest that griefs, grief um, reactions fall into five different patterns, right? So while, you know, we might think of our, our, our death, our own death uh, in various stages, there are also uh, ways that we grieve um, people who pass on. And, you know, the absent grief or resilient pattern is that kind of that first uh, first pattern of grief. And this is kind of the low levels of depression before and after a spouse's death. And this is this is actually one of the most common patterns uh, of death. Um, it is exhibited by roughly 50 percent of bereaved spouses. And then you have what we call chronic grief. Uh, this is really, really low pre-loss grief or depression, excuse me, uh, followed by sustained depression um, after the spouse's death. And, um, you know, it it happens where, you know, you don't really um, you, you can't you can't really think about it as it as it's happening or when it's happening. Um, but after they die, then you you develop this really um, chronic depression and sustained depression over a long period of time. Uh, common grief is a, a spike in depression shortly after the spouse's death and then a, a decline, decline, excuse me, in depression over time. You know, this might be the second most common where, you know, you, you have this uh, wave of, of really, really high depression at the, at the at the onset of the death of the spouse. And then there's a decline in depression over time. Um, and it doesn't mean that the depression goes away. There might be days where, you know, you, you have a really, really high level of depression and there are other days where you're, you know, you're okay. Um, but no one really gets over uh, the loss of someone. Um, it's, a, it's a process um, that happens over the, over the course of time. Um, time does and can heal um, some wounds, uh, but does not heal all. And grief is one of those that, you know, maybe may, may be something that's kind of continuous um, over the course of our life. Um, depressed improved uh, is a high pre-loss depression followed by uh, a relatively quick and sustained decline in depression after the spouse's death. Uh, and then the last one is chronic depression, which is um, high levels of depression both before and long after the spouse was lost. And, you know, some of these things happen just based on situation. Um, if I know my spouse is, you know, kind of chronically ill, and I've kind of been preparing myself for uh, their death. And uh, if I know that they're chronically ill and they're, they're suffering, they're in pain, um, maybe I, I have a, a level of depression after they die. Uh, but I've been preparing myself because I knew that it was, was approaching uh, and it's not so much and not so, no, it's not as difficult uh, to get over um, the grief um, later on because, I, again, I, I prepared myself for it. Um, so the preparation piece uh, and the situational piece is really, really um, um, important to, to consider um, because chronic depression can happen if you have something that just someone just suddenly died. Maybe they died from a, a car accident or from, you know, uh, a diagnosis that was really, really quick um, that could develop chronic depression, um, really prolonged levels of depression over the course of time, right? And then we take, think about, um, you know, how would COVID, the COVID pandemic, how, how about, how might that affect uh, individuals' re reactions? Because they weren't able to really go into the hospitals. A lot of people weren't able to see uh, their loved one. And they, you know, they had very, very small funerals. Um, you know, because people with COVID, they didn't really understand what what was happening and, and what uh, yeah, what would happen um, if people had you know open caskets and those types of things. Um, so how how may have that how may that have affected uh, some people's grief reactions? Right, not being able to see your loved one right before uh, kind of the pre loss uh, and then after. Right, you know what what that what how might that affected uh, individuals in their grief process? And research has been been, you know, shown um, and, and trying to uncover um, how that might affect, uh, you know, the, the process of the patterns of grief uh, in the long term. Okay. But here's just a, a discussion, you know, as people age, um, they often face loss of, you know, both physical, neural, and cognitive function. Uh, but, you know, just kind of think about 
identify the steps and practice that you might be able to incorporate to uh, be proactive about your health. You know, how can you maintain good health as you age? What things might you be able to do um, to make sure that your physical, your neural, and your cognitive functioning uh, are maintained? Because um, I think it's important that we think through those things. Um, uh, we want to live and have longevity, um, but we want to live a life that is uh, healthy. We want to we want to be living a life where we we feel good, right? We don't want to live with a lot of pain and a lot of cognitive dysfunction. I right? want to have great neural functioning and have a really high quality of life in late adulthood. Uh, so what things can we do now um, and in middle adulthood to make sure that we're living a life that is uh, really, really fun and, and happy and fulfilling um, even until late adulthood? Okay. So here's just some self-assessments and things that you might want to consider as you begin to study uh, the chapter. Uh, but can you identify the three stages of prenatal development? You know, uh, the germinal stage, the uh, embryonic stage, and the fetal stage. Uh, how can or how can when do various motor skills develop? You know, you know, pre-operational. Look at you know the operational stage, concrete operational stage. Um, think about those different stages. Uh, you know, how do we move into young adulthood? You know, how do perceptions and expectations change over uh, the course of our life? You know, what what is physical development changes occur? You know, we talked about spermarchy and monarchy uh, and those different changes that occur. And when when does that happen? Um, what contributes to successful aging? You know, think about that. How do you promote successful aging? And then the last thing is, you know, what is the role of nature and nurture in influencing our behavior? Um, that's one question that we always ask. Um, but again, we've seen that there are environmental things that can influence and then there are predispositions, uh, things that we, we get naturally through genetics uh, that influence us as well. And there's just a summary of, of things that uh, you should know you know, um, you should be able to kind of outline these things and summarize these things in a, in a, in a really effective way um, as we start to prepare for studying for, for exams and tests. Okay. All right. And then the last one. Okay. So this is the last, this is the end here. Um, chapter 10, again, the human development across the lifespan. So we talked about uh, at conception, right, your zygote. You, you know, your cells divide and you become a embryo, you become a fetus, you become an infant, uh, you get into early, early childhood, you reach uh, adolescence, you reach your emerging adulthood, middle adulthood, and then you move into late adulthood. And those parts of life and, and all of them require that our environment. Um, and naturally things happen to us, but the environment plays a big role in, in who we become, right? And so... Uh, what ways can we uh, help to create a better quality of life, not only uh, in early childhood and adolescence, not in only in middle adulthood, but also in late adulthood. And, and the things that we do now are going to influence the things that we experience later. So we have to be mindful of that um, as we live and think and, and make decisions uh, in, our, in our current circumstances and situation. Okay. But this will be the end. We'll see you all uh, next chapter.